So this, this morning we're going to continue um, reading through Colossians. And we're in Colossians chapter 4. And we've got to a little, just a short little passage. This will, this will be our last week in Colossians. And I just want to focus on Colossians 4, verses 2 to 6. So it's a short little passage. And it reads like this. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains so that I may make it known as I should. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. The... The first phrase there, devote yourselves to prayer, is kind of the the sentence, if you like, or the phrase that I I kind of want to anchor myself in this morning. And I feel the need to preface what I'm going to say a little bit this morning. Um, How many in this room, how many of you feel like you really understand prayer and you've got it sorted? You're with me then. Um, I speak today as a learner. (laughs) I I do not claim to be an expert in prayer. I want to get that out there straight away. We're looking at what God's word says to us about prayer. And and I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life when um, maybe you've you've had those moments, those seasons when praying is a joy and, and you just feel alive. And then there's another day where you wake up and you get to like bedtime and realise, oh, I haven't prayed today. I don't know. My life is a roller coaster of prayer. With, with, I'll, I'll admit that freely. There are some days it's great and I feel really connected to God. And there are other days when I don't. There is something I've observed. I struggle more when I don't pray. So I want to think today about what does it mean to pray. And I want to kind of flit around a little bit, not just into this passage, but immediately in my head comes Jesus' teaching in John 15. It depends which version of the Bible you've got, where he says, abide in me or remain in me. Uh, And the the picture that he gives us is a branch in a vine. And basically Jesus says, if you stay connected to me, if you stay living with me, you'll be fruitful. If you don't, you won't. (laughs) It's as simple as that. And and this idea of abiding or remaining, um, of communing, if I like, we've just had communion, where we share together and we commune, we spend time with God. That's, that's the concept. To commune is to share life, to live together. And the idea that Jesus paints is of we live with him in this life. Now, have you ever tried living with someone who you're not talking to? A few people should have said yes then. Yeah, Um, those moments in life where things get a little bit tense and the people you're sharing the house with, I wonder how long, how, I wonder how, no, I won't go there. I was going to say, how long did you last not talking? One day, one, two days, three days? I don't know. Maybe that's a a question for another day. Um, But it's really, really difficult to share life with someone if you don't talk to them. Think about it. It's it's obvious, really, isn't it? This is what we mean by prayer. By by use the word prayer to describe how I speak to God or I speak with God. And there's a few things about prayer that I just kind of want to, to kind of make very, very, very clear. The first is it's really hard to talk to someone who you can't see. Have you noticed that? It's a lot easier if you can see them. 
It's, it's the same on the telephone even. I don't know how you find the telephone, but if I'm talking to someone on the telephone, I, I want to know what their face is doing when I say things. Are they smiling? Are they frowning? Are they watching the telly? Um, are they, you know, what's happening? So we have a challenge when it comes to talking with God because we can't physically see him. But when we mean, what we mean by prayer is simply talking to God, which can be as simple as saying, good morning, Jesus. Bless you. That's another prayer. Do you know that? The Lord bless you. Yeah? See, prayer should be woven into our language. And when we talk to God, it's really important we understand something. Um, so it really, really, which for me is quite, I think is quite important for me in my life. I don't know about you, but it's really important to me. Um, there's no magic in prayer. I'm, I'm, I meet people sometimes and they say, will you pray for me? As if somehow my prayer is more special than theirs. Or I meet people who say, can we get lots and lots of people to pray about this? As if somehow God's ears will be more attentive if 50 people pray rather than five. One of the things I find fascinating about scripture is how often God heard the prayer of the one. Not the many. Because the power of that is, is found through prayer is not in the practice of prayer. It's in the one who we pray to. You see, I, I, could, I can pray to a table. It's called idolatry. I can pray to a statue. There's no power in that because there's no power in the table or in the statue. When we talk to God, we are engaging with a God who is all-powerful, who is almighty, who hears and is attentive, and he listens, and he loves us, and he cares about us. So when we're talking to him, he's like a heavenly father who wants to hear from us. So when going back to Colossians, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 says, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it, don't fall asleep. That's the big problem with prayer meetings, isn't it? If you're not careful, you fall asleep. Yeah, especially when they're late at night. I did an all-night prayer meeting once or twice in my life, and it's really difficult staying awake. So Paul says, stay alert and be thankful in everything. Okay, how do you pray? Let's get really practical now. How do you pray? I wonder what your prayer routine is like. Um... Traditionally, of course, we d encourage people, don't we, to have a daily time of devotion with God, yeah? Yeah? How many people recognise that language, daily devotions? Sometimes we get, have little booklets that we use, which gives us a little scripture and a recommended prayer that we can pray. Um, but a time set apart for God. I can see we've got some very um, excited, energetic little ones with us today. This reminds me, it's a perfect illustration for my talk, think, thoughts about prayer. Um, I can remember when my children were that size, behaving very similarly. Lots of noise, wanting to do their own thing and wanting my attention. And I can remember this, um, getting up in the morning to pray on your own when you have little children is dangerous. Because they get up. And I found that as I started to pray in the morning, I would get up in the morning, I thought, I'll, I'm going to really try hard at this, this daily devotions level. I'm going to make my dad proud. I'm going to do it right. I'm going to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and pray. Yeah? Right? So I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. My son gets up at 6 a.m. Can I pray? No. I thought, I'm not going to let him defeat him. Half past five. Guess what time he got up? Half oh, past five. I thought, this is ridiculous. I'll go for 5 a.m. He got up at 5 a.m. I said, God, this is ridiculous. How am I supposed to do this? And then I discovered something. I had a lunch hour when all my kids were not around. 
And so I made a decision. I took my lunch break every day. I walked away from my desk and I spent time with God. You see, we need to find a way to spend time every day with God. You may be an early riser. 5 a.m. to you may be a dream. If so, God bless you. Okay? You may be a night hour, in which case 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night might be a dream for you, in which case, God bless you, I'll be sleeping. Right? Some of us struggle both ends of the day. In which case, lunchtime's brilliant. I'm awake. Someone put it like this. Find the best time of the day when you can give your best attention and then give it to Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6, this is how you should pray. Go somewhere on your own where it's just you and the Father in secret. And he'll reward you for that. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6, was caught out. Why? Because he had a regular pattern of prayer. In Acts chapter 3, wonderful little story. Peter and John were on their way to pray. They were following the regular pattern of prayer. And I would encourage us all somehow find a way to spend time every day with Jesus. If you need notes to help you get started, come and speak to us. We'll share some with you. Um, those of you who've known me long enough, I recommend a little book called The Divine Mentor. Um, excellent little book which will teach you how to do that yourself at home. But prayer shouldn't be confined to just a short time I spend with God. What about through the day? 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 says, pray constantly. <laughs> pray constantly. Talk to Jesus about everything and anything. Um, this, this, this can be a challenge. Um, and I have to confess, this is something that I come back to every now and again and I say, try again. Um, because I, I, if you're anything like me, if I start the day well with Jesus, by the time I get to lunch time, um, I'm starting to think about a snack and things I've got to do for the rest of the day. And if I'm not careful, I can forget about Jesus all afternoon. Particularly if you're at work. I mean, I don't know about you. You, you get off, you get in the morning, you get to work, and if, if you're not careful, it's busy, 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 busy. It gets to the end of the day and you're going home and you're saying, Wow, God, thank you for getting me through. Sorry I didn't have a chance to chat. Because you're just so busy. But what about if we brought Jesus or were aware that Jesus was with us in every moment of every day? Um, when I was in college, um, we had a wonderful lady. Um, we called her Mrs. D, Mrs. Dunnett. She was lovely, brilliant lady. Um, but she would pray with you anywhere. Some of you may have heard my stories about this. I can remember one day I was walking to Tesco's. And I was walking to Tesco's and I saw her walking down the road ahead of me and I thought, oh, there's a road in between us I've got to cross. Do I slow down and let her cross the road or do I speed up so I can cross the road first? Because I don't want to meet her in the middle. Because if I meet her in the middle, she's going to stop me and pray for me in the middle of the road, which is not safe. But literally, she would stop you. If she had a conversation with you, she'd pray for you. It, you didn't meet her on her own. It was always her and Jesus. It didn't matter where you went. It didn't matter what you did. It, it, just, it just, where you were, if you were in, in the middle of the supermarket, that didn't matter. It didn't matter if you're outdoors, indoors, if it was formal, informal, anywhere you went. If you met her and had a conversation with her, she'd pray for you. She's one of the people who I can honestly look at and say, yeah, she prayed through every day. <laughs> what 
what if we could be a little bit more like that? Wherever we went, it wasn't just me, it's me and Jesus. And so if you're going to have a conversation with me, I'm going to bring Jesus into it somehow, somewhere. But then there's times things happen. So in Philippians 4, um, there's that wonderful little passage, verses 6 and 7. You know, bring everything to God in prayer and petition um, with thanksgiving. Um, bring all things to God in prayer with, and petition with thanksgiving. And sometimes in life, we hit things, we hit issues, we hit needs, we hit concerns, and we need to ask God for something. So we need to ask. Um, one of the lessons that I've had to learn in my life is simply this. Um, God will often leave me if I'm uh, in wrestling with my own strength until I ask for help. And it's only when I ask for help that he'll help me. And it's almost like he steps aside and he says, what do you want to do, Jeff? And I'm sitting there going, I, I can work this out. I can work this out. I, I can sort this. I can get through. I, I can make it. I can do this. And he says, okay. And then I get to a point and I say, okay, God, I, I can't do this no more. He says, oh, good. Shall I do it then? And then God steps in. We need to take things to God and then trust him with them. If people say to me, well, you know, why, why aren't my prayers always answered? Okay. Let me, let me give you a really, really simple illustration. In our house, uh, in our kitchen, there's a particular cupboard, and in that particular cupboard, there's a little bag, and in that little bag are treats for grandchildren. They all know where the cupboard is. They don't need to have the door open, and they know there are treats there for them. I hope you know that you have a Heavenly Father who has a bag of treats for you. Yeah, I hope you know that. And when they arrive at our house, it's, can I have? Can I have? And normally it's, yeah, of course you can, because we're the grandparents and we can stuff them full of chocolate and send them home. And that's, that's fine. Yeah. But sometimes they'll come in and say, can I have? And I'll look and I'll go, you're just about to eat tea in 15 minutes. No. And they go, bah, bah, bah. And I go, no. Sometimes God doesn't give us an answer that we want because he knows better than we do. And we have to trust him. And it never seems fair. Because I can't see what he sees. And I don't know what he knows. But I have to have a relationship with God that's strong enough that I can trust him. And sometimes I've gone to God and I've said, God, my friend needs help. Heal them. And he's gone, yay, and I've seen them healed. And other times I've gone to God and said, my friend needs help. Heal them. And he goes, not yet. And I go, what? Why? And I can tell you this, it's not about us because it's not in our gift and it's not about how we pray, because there's no power in prayer. If you ask a table, a table can't do anything. It's about God, who is a person, who has his own mind and his own thoughts and his own plans and his own ways, and he will do what he will do. He will have, I think it's somewhere, it says, I will have mercy on who I choose to have mercy. And we have to trust him. But we must still should go to him and ask. Because I'll tell you this, every one of my grandchildren knows that there's a cupboard with a bag of treats in. And they have no hesitation in asking for them. In fact, some of them have even found out there's treats in other places. And, and they will go looking. And um, I have to listen out very carefully to see which cupboards are being opened and which, which doors when, when I'm not in the room. God delights for us to ask. 
and often he will give. But do we take those issues to him? And what about with others? Um, there's numerous examples in scripture of people gathering to pray. Um, over and over and over again you see it. One, often in crisis situations. So Acts chapter 2 verse 42, you see them devoting themselves to prayer. Um, at the beginning of the church, they were devoted themselves to prayer. They came together to pray. What is all of this saying to us? This is all saying to us, stay connected to Jesus. Every day, talk to him. Don't forget about him through the day in all that you're doing, whether it's shopping, whether it's... How about when, you, you know, when you're in a, in a queue at the supermarket praying for the person in front of you or the person on the checkout? You don't get checkout people anymore, do you? You just get machines. Um, pray for the poor person that's got to look after all the machines because they're often very stressed. What about when you're wandering around and you see someone in the supermarket and you can see they're struggling and you just maybe give them a helping hand, but maybe also pray for them. Or when we're out and about, when we meet people. Stay connected with Jesus. When there's specific issues in life, take them to Jesus. And what about when we come together to pray? How do we come together to pray? As a whole church, you've got an opportunity this evening. Look forward to seeing you all. A half past six. Yeah. Or what in small groups? What about meeting with a friend to pray? Well, I want to quickly move on because I want to talk about the next verse. See, staying connected is really, really important, but here's something that's challenging, I think. Verse 3, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains, so that I may make it known as I should. <laughs> and I want to ask the question, what do we pray for? What do we pray for? In all this questioning of God, what, what do we come to him and what do we are? Because I don't know about you, but it's too easy for me to bring my agenda to God rather than asking God, what is on your heart? And, and, and some people might say, well, I don't, I don't know, how do I know what's on God's heart? Well, let me tell you a few things. He's given us lots in his word about what he values and what he treasures and what is on his heart. And this verse in itself tells us something powerful. Paul says... Remember, Paul's writing probably from a prison cell, not in a good place. He could have said, please pray I get out soon. Please pray the persecution will stop. No, he says, please pray that I may be able to keep preaching the word, that I may continue to be a witness for Christ. And this goes back to Jesus' final words, the Great Commission found at the end of Matthew chapter 28, when he says to his disciples, right now, all authority is mine, so you go in all, into all of the world and make disciples. You see, Jesus' priority was the establishment of the kingdom of God. That's why he's taught his disciples, when you pray, start off by saying, God, you're great, hallowed be your name. We honour a God who is above all, so we recount his names, which remind us of the character of God and who he is. And then immediately we say, and your kingdom come, and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. The first thing we pray for is God's kingdom. That's how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Paul has picked that up. So he says, the first thing I want you to do is pray that the kingdom may advance. Pray that people may come to know Jesus. I'm looking at the clock thinking, how much time can I spare? I'd encourage you to go and read Acts chapter 8. Um, Acts chapter 8, round there, 8 and 9. Um, there's so much in that chapter about prayer and people coming to know Jesus. So first of all, you've got Saul, and um, in verse, verse, there's persecution. 
in, in verse 4, those who were scattered went on their way preaching the word. It really, I think it really should say speaking the word rather than preaching the word, declaring the word. Um, one person summarized that verse as gossiping the gospel. Gossiping the gospel. Um, you know, Jesus has done so much in my life. How can I not tell you about him? Do you, can you echo that? You know, God's, God's changed me so much, how can I not tell you about it? You know, I, I have nothing to offer people, so if they come to me and say, Jeff, can you help me? I go, no, but I know a man who can. And his name's Jesus. You see, it, it, that's what we should be so connected to Jesus, that wherever we go, we talk about Jesus. As you keep going down through, through the chapter, you find um, there's this wonderful situation um, where people hear the gospel, respond to the gospel, get touched by the gospel. Um, they need to clearly hear the truth. Then there's the wonderful story of the Ethiopian. First of all, Philip is available where God says, I'm sending you. So he says, okay, I'll go. That, that's, that's the first thing. I'll go. I'll go, to, I'll go tell people about Jesus. Then he meets this guy and he says to him, uh, uh, who happens to be reading the scriptures, and he says, do you understand it? And the guy says, how can I understand it? Unless someone explains it. See, th- this point, see, we need to not just tell the truth, but we need to speak the truth. We need to explain the truth to people. We need to answer questions. We need to encourage people in their journeys with God. And at the end of that, how, well, what's going to stop me from being baptized? You see, we want people not just to hear the gospel, but to respond to the gospel. And so that's why we put those little cards out at the beginning of this year. And there's some in the foyer there. Will you pray for one person? Will you pray for one person to be in church next Sunday who doesn't know Jesus? Will you pray for one of your friends to have an encounter with God? How about that? Just start praying for one. Because it's too hard to pray for lots. But just pray for one. You don't have to have a person in mind. I will often say, please God, send us one new person. I don't know who he's going to send. But please God, send us one new person. Are we praying for the gospel to be proclaimed? Or are we so focused on our own needs and our own illnesses and our own problems that we have lost sight of the lost? Let me put it this way. I'm saved. Are you saved? Yeah. I'm saved. I have a future. I have a hope. Do you want me to tell you about it? It's called heaven. And I, my Lord has promised me, whatever happens in this life, don't worry about it. You've got an eternity ahead with him. And in that eternal living with him, there's going to be no more pain, It's going to be no more suffering. It's going to be no more grief. There's going to be no more tears or crying. It's going to be a beautiful, amazing existence in the presence, wrapped up in the presence of God. That's going to be amazing. So this life is just like, I've just got to get through this bit so I can get there. But I want to take you there with me. And so, if I've got a little bit of an ache or a pain, do you know what? Um, Lord, this is an ache and a pain. And he says, yeah, but don't worry. Your body might be wearing out. That's why there's a new one on order. (laughs) Seriously, you've not read Revelation. Yeah. New heaven, new earth. this This is just temporary. There's a proper one coming. This is just the, this is just just to get you by. But eternity is what matters. And so I'd look round at all of you guys today and I'd say, if you don't know you've got a future in heaven with God, you need Jesus. You really do. Because that's what lasts. This is just temporary. And so I might have a few aches and pains. I might have, life might be difficult. But do you know what? I I know, I know God has something better for me in store. Occasionally, he 
gives us a taste of that now, which is amazing. And occasionally you'll meet someone and they'll get completely healed of something. What is that? That's not God making our life here better. That's God saying, here's a little taste. Here's a little foretaste of what's to come, which is even more amazing. That's why signs follow the proclamation of the gospel. And God is more interested. John's gospel, every miracle in John's gospel is called a sign. You know that? It's called a sign. Signs point you in a direction to God. Yeah? If you know where you're going, you don't need a sign. Signs are for those people who don't know where they're going. So if I want to travel somewhere, I need a sign to point me in the right direction. If I know the way, I don't even look at the signs. And I would suggest this to us who are believers, to us who are passionate followers of Jesus. Don't worry about looking for a sign for yourself. You know where you're going. You know you're headed to eternity. You know you're heading into the arms of a loving Heavenly Father. That's fantastic. Give a sign to those who need it, who are lost and who need Jesus. That's where our focus should be. That's where our heart should be. And I can't go on to talk about what I would talk about if I had any more time. But the next verse talks about, so live carefully, making the most of the time you've got. And so what I would say is this, just to wrap up, is this. I've noticed I'm getting older. Have you noticed that? Um... And I've noticed that as you get older, you suddenly start to realise you haven't got as long left as you thought. <laughs> I don't know whether you've had that. Has that come into your mind? Okay. What are we going to do with the time we have here? How are we going to live? Are we going to stay connected to Jesus? Are we going to make it about Jesus and for Jesus? Or do we want to just have a good time? And do we want to bring other people with us into eternity? If so, we need to start asking God, please, Lord, will you work in our midst? So I'd like to just wrap up by praying. Father, you are an amazing God. You are an incredible God. You chose to leave eternity and come to this earth. Jesus, we thank you for your life. Thank you for teaching. Thank you for showing us what it means to live properly in God's sight. But most of all, thank you for bearing our sin, my sin, on that cross. Thank you that you laid your life down for me. Thank you that you rose from the dead. You conquered sin and death. You are now raised to the Father's right hand. And you will come again. And we look forward to that. Thank you that we are yours. And you are ours. Oh God, may we live that way. Staying connected to you, talking to you day by day and hour by hour. May we learn to do this better. Teach us and guide us and inspire us by your spirit. That we might genuinely become people who know how to pray. We ask this in your name. Amen.